are the trees regarding our gender identity and sexuality. When there's no place like home, empty air and empty establishment. For your civil rights Out on the cruel Streets tonight Happy Pride to listeners everywhere Listeners will recall that last week I played the first part of a panel discussion that was organised by the European Parliament It was to coincide with International Day against Homophobia biphobia and transphobia it included a discussion on LGBTQ plus youth and mental health and it was held in the Europa House in Dublin and last week as I said I played you the first part the speakers that were there on the day were Maria Walsh who is a member of the European Parliament Meninia Griffin who heads up belong to youth services Rory O'Neill appearing as Rory O'Neill rather than Panty Bliss and it was presided over excellently by Afrikne Kredoin, who is the CEO of Shoutout. This week I'm going to play you the second part. Now, it continues with the same panel. Last week, Afrik gave maybe about 10 minutes each to each of the participants, and they all made their different presentations on the topic. This week, Afrik questions each of the participants from a particular standpoint we will probably play the third part which includes the question and answer session that will uh, come out maybe next week depending on how much pride material we've got by today you will have heard the um, lion's share of the discussions and it's amazing to be able to talk about Ireland as being an inspiration to others but we can also look at the work that's being done in countries where it is especially difficult now and maybe learn from their stories because there's organizations in places like Hungary and Poland and Romania who are doing similar work to organizations here under very different conditions. And have you learned anything from seeing those groups in action, from seeing the changes they're trying to make and seeing the optimism that they're trying to hold in these very bleak outlooks? Absolutely. I think there's, I think that's one of the greatest benefits of being a part of the European Union is that shared peace. Um, to Rory's point, I remember um, over way back when, over COVID years, um, meeting virtually with uh, Polish MPs to try and they wanted to know the blueprint to which the marriage referendum and the repeal of the eighth was passed here because they literally wanted to take the cookie cut of it and, and, and work that. But when you looked at their own story, I guess it's like anything when you're so close to something uh, and it's in your face, being reminded from outside voices, it's like, well, you've actually done exactly what, what you've set out to do and, um, and, and be that cheerleader voice and, and raise the issues um, that, that, that have been the case. I mean, Hungary, Poland, even community members in Ukraine, um, Moldova, so I, like what's going on right now with the, with the war, um, you know, the, I know multiple organisations that she fled to the border to make sure LGBTI community members were safe, and um, and it's phenomenal to see that because it's only in the history books that we see that type of uh, uh, need for support and care under duress, such as war. Now, wars are happening uh, across the world, but on 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 European soil, um, there's definitely shared practices as I mentioned. Um, one actually an amazing example is when the lovely people in Poland uh, decided, and they're only a small minority because we ha we actually home uh, over 100, 150,000 Polish in Ireland. So, uh, and 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 a number of years ago, Rory's just reminded me our Irish story and different things and changing it wasn't always as great, but we we've moved uh, leaps and bounds. But around the the LGBT free zones. Mm -hmm. Um, like it was remarkable support to civil society organisations on the ground there when even our Irish councils um, refused then to 20 towns that had that. I mean that was 
fun, that was unbelievable. And at the speed it did, and it was a cross party. It wasn't just one or two politicians trying to, trying to, trying to take that. Now that has also led to uh, secondary schools or high schools around those areas going into secondary schools to learn about LGBTI orientation, um, sexual reproductive education, um, and they've they've run a very successful pilot project since that in areas and if you see the geographical spread it's around those free zones that, that they declared so that then came from best practices because they would have looked to Mignonet's work and um, uh, even your work and, and across even in the UK at the time too to see what they were doing in those best practices I mean that's ultimately the, 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 the that's how you become gold standard and everything when you're willing to work and, and listen to all voices at the table and making sure you're not leaving um, anybody behind, um, and, and that's, I mean, that's ultimately, I think, why we're all here. Uh, at least I hope, to, I hope, and a lot of work to do. But um, you cannot have one of one of my one of my, I guess, the difficulty sometimes I have in my job is, um, you know, I could speak to a school on a Monday morning in in Mayo, um, and they're asking questions and, and and challenging me about LGBTI rights or. Um, sexual reproductive rights or mental health say and then you sit into the parliament the next morning um, and you have this extremism and this from the far left to the far right and, and you're trying to find a balanced voice within that while, it, while it's also getting squeezed and you have people like Fidesz asking questions uh, around education of LGBTQI which is really just red herrings to what else is going on um, and then it's, it's not necessarily just about LGBTQI rights then, it's actually about democracy yeah, and preserving it. Um, and, and, and that bedrock of where we need to move as the European Union. And, um, and if people are not adhering to the fundamental values, then, then, then we need to deliver on, I, the buzzword right now is sanctions, but we have to deliver on uh, tougher, uh, tougher, because uh, within Hungary and, and what I try and, and I promise I'll wrap up now, uh, within Hungary what I try and uh, rem remind people is, um, is the fact that here we have had seen great waves of change as Rory and Nina have shared, amazing waves of change, but we also have a number of LGBTQI students that travel overseas to European countries. Um, we send a number of um, thousands of young veterinary students to the likes of Hungary um, just to study and train because our system here is uh, to my point. And similar to what Meninye uh, and their body of research around COVID, then you end up with a number of young people trying to figure out how the hell they're showing up in this world and who they're showing up as, um, and then being further pushed into the closet, uh, for lack of a better phrase, um, because they're in these countries that are deemed European Union and open and welcome, but actually in reality are not. Um, so I think I went on a tangent uh, there and, it, and lost the train of thought. But I think there's just so many, so many examples of that imbalance. But ultimately, I mean, it's back to if we don't work together. And that imbalance only goes goes wider. But I think it's it's relevant as well because young people in Ireland don't exist in isolation from young LGBTI mm -hmm. people elsewhere, especially when they spent the past two years mostly online. Young people are quite keenly aware of what's being done to LGBTI people around the world, and they're not immune to this. Young people, young trans people here will be seeing what's happening in America, and they'll be horrified and <coughs> scared because they see how quickly it can happen. Do you see that in the service? Do you see the impact of what young people pick up online, the negativity, the hate and the fear? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely, and, and just to go back to the, the, the need for collaboration, the, the extremists, and I don't call them far, left, far right because some of them are far left as well, and mm -hmm. um, the extremists um, who are anti-democratic aren't, you know, I'm not sure if they really do hate LGBT people. I think that they just want to stabilize democracy. So what they, they use wedge issues like trans rights or abortion rights or whatever to cause, um, you know, a, a, unrest in a community, uh, they, they abuse online platforms, um, we've seen this so much, so much, I mean, I, in my time we belong to, and seven years now, I think things in some ways, uh, that casual homophobia um, is, is it's, it's increased, mm -hmm. I think, over the past few years, and I definitely would uh, attribute a lot of that to um, extremist, a, a, a strategic decision to uh, plant material online, to 
get people, um, bring people down rabbit holes, to normalize homophobic language, ho uh, transphobic language online, uh, radicalize uh, uh, online users, uh, so that uh, then offline that language, that behavior, those attitudes are considered less um, radical and more mainstream. You know, we would even see it in, in youth services, in youth clubs, LGBT um, young people using that's so gay or the F word or different things like that. And we have to go, hang on, do you know what you're doing? You know, because it's become so normalized. Um, and, and I don't think that was the case 10 years ago. So I think, it, it, you know, we, I think the politicians, activists, we, we have to work together across the European Union, across the world. I'm just back from an ILGA World Conference and we did talk about these anti-trans narratives and how they are the same. Borders, there's no such thing as, uh, as jurisdictions or country borders when you're talking about these, uh, these, the, the fight um, for trans rights because uh, the, 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 the anti-trans narratives are global at this stage meeting colleagues from Uganda, Iran, um, uh, Europe, North America, South America, it's all the same language that they're, they're encountering. So we as, as um, in the civil society across um, uh, you know, LGBT activism, whether that's in, in, our, in our parliaments, the uh, European parliament, in our, in our unions, in our, in our NGOs, we have to come together and collaborate if we're going to um, disrupt that narrative and expose it for what it is so that ordinary citizens who, um, uh, you know, they're not stupid, it's just that these strategies are very, very targeted. You know, so um, well, there was one example at a, a meeting I was at um, a couple of weeks ago where um, they targeted uh, people who went running in Central Park within a, a certain period of the morning. So they started uh, talking about, um, uh, you know, attacks um, on people in Central Park at that time of the morning. Um, uh, you know, so it, it, it can, it's very um, sophisticated um, and it's so easy. I see that with friends and family, how, um, you know, we saw that during COVID with the anti-vax or before that it was something else. They bring you in on, on they find you online with something you might be pissed off about, mm -hmm. that you might be angry about, and suddenly you are having a conversation with a brother-in-law who's who's has much more, um, uh, you know, uh, conservative views about issues that in the past they might have just got, shrugged their shoulders and said, "Yeah, I'm living left, live. I, I don't care about that." So. So yeah, <laughs> sorry, the last one. One of the most did. terrifying to me and one of the most successful you know, attempts at this kind of you know, um, strategy of mm -hmm. late is the, to, re, to conflate, as they did in the 70s and so on, um, you know, being a queer with being a paedophile. Oh, yeah. I mean, and that is absolutely a, a planned strategy yeah. um, that has been very terrifyingly successful of late. And it does also um, make me think, you know, when I was you know, a teenager, and maybe the country was more homophobic then, but unless somebody walked up to me in the street and called me a faggot, I didn't really know, um, in a sense, or if I was, happened to be watching the right television channel at the right time. Um, whereas nowadays, um, kids are online all the time, and that stuff is everywhere. And you can be alone in your bedroom, um, you know, seeing all that stuff directed at you, or people just like you. And, um, and so, e e although, uh, the, the country may be less homophobic than it was, you know, 30 years ago. Um, I think if you're a, a, a teenager alone in your bedroom, it doesn't necessarily feel like that at all, because hundreds of people are screaming that you're a paedophile, um, you know, uh, online at you while you're, you know, alone in your bedroom. And it's not just online. It's we saw even this week with the lesbian couple that was attacked. Yeah. But it feels like every week there's another picture on social media of some poor yeah. person who's been attacked in Dublin or somewhere else. Yeah. Um, and we've seen the really extreme ends of that, but. Is this something you're seeing in the community? Are you seeing any fear as a response to that in venues, in spaces within the community and in the city? Yeah, I mean, we've had discussions about it, you know, inter-venue. Um, you know, there, there, there was some discussion about, you know, how much it's gotten worse and was there sort of a sense 
for a, for a while, post-referendum and all that, that maybe we felt embarrassed and didn't want to talk about those things when they happened, and then maybe now we're, you know, we're but then I think there definitely has been an uptick in it. Um, you know, we, you know, in Pant of Arlone, you know, we had the brick through the window, um, you know, with the thing about faggots, you know, taped onto the brick, and then sort of somewhat later on, we had the pedo signs spray painted on the wall next door. Um, so, you know, those things do seem to be occurring more, and, and in, the, um, in the one with the brick in the window, you can absolutely see the, uh, the effect of the internet on that, because he was documenting um, his whole journey to throwing a brick in our window, you know, on one of these message boards, and not a single person on the message board told him not to do it, or that it was a bad idea. They mostly just ignored him. Um, and so, you know, that stuff is definitely bubbled up more and, you know, become a, a more acute issue right, in the last while. Um, and yes, we've had discussions with the other venues, um, trying to, see, we're trying to see if we could come up with any ways of easing concerns about those things because there is definitely, um, your concern is being felt in the community. Yeah. I think there's, I think there's a couple of things, a few things I think there are, uh, it's, I think you're right, I think, uh, before the referendum, I think that kind of stuff might have happened and nobody would have been as surprised mm. and so it might not have reported. Whereas now when it happens, people are like, oh my god, I can't believe this is happening in this day and age. So I think um, there's, two, there's two things happening. First, people are more outraged and therefore it's, it's, it is going online. Uh, and then the second thing is there are more, ex there is a small group but more extreme feeling entitled um, we know from the research that if you do not close down this extremist language online, if you don't address it, what happens is that spills out onto the street. Um, you know, I, 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 you know, so that's why it's so important to, to you know, that we, uh, you know, we get that right and we work with platforms, and uh, so that algorithms and that are, are are not just for profit; that they are, uh, they also keep people safe. Being online is not being in a supermarket or a shopping centre. It's the same thing. Just because you're online, you should be protected when you're online in the same way as you would out in public. Uh, but I, other think, I think the other thing that you raised is really interesting is this, this people not standing up against mm -hmm. when they see it. And I do th see that more. And I think some of that is, you know, cancel culture, people afraid to stand up. Um, and that's something that we are you know, I think we need to be um, concerned about because I think that we know the majority of people in Ireland are supportive of LGBT rights. You go out, you, any time you poll, you know, um, do, uh, you sh do you think LGBT people deserve equal rights, equal treatment, blah, blah, blah. Yes, you know, huge, hugely positive, um, which isn't across the, the, the EU. Um, so why is it people don't feel comfortable s stepping up and standing up? And I think that sometimes it's a fear of getting it wrong and then being shout shouted down by the other side, and that's going to happen. So I think what what you know um, organisations like Belong To and, and Tenny and LGBT Ireland are really trying to do is to build people's capacity and confidence to to call it out when they see it. And um, and we're going to be working together o over the the coming year to really build people's confidence and capacity online and offline. So when you see somebody say something transphobic, um, that you um, that you know, hang on, that's wrong, and you may have a gut feeling about it, but you might go, oh, well, I'm a bit afraid of getting weighing in there. Um, that's wrong. I know how to rebut that, and I feel confident and, and that w when I do, that people will, will stand, in, stand with me. I might get a backlash from the 50 uh, people online who are going to be very loud and very aggressive, uh, but I will have other people will have my back, and I think you know we need to work uh, um, as activists as a community to empower our allies as well as the rest of the people in the community. So it's not just down to activists to be uh, online, and you know we were speaking about the the, the scary uh, event he was at, an activist that we all know and love on this panel. This is her story, so we don't want. To, to, to name names, but she was invited to speak at an event in her hometown um, only a couple of months ago. They had to shut that down because she had death threats. Um, 
you know, the guard said it wasn't safe, they put it online instead. So this kind of stuff is happening here too. This stuff is happening and it, I think it's frightening and I think we've unpacked a lot of the kind of negativity and the fear that is within the community today. But I do want us to go out on something of a positive outlook before we maybe take some questions from the audience. Um, and I guess I want to ask each of you maybe quickly to think about what young LGBTI people have to look forward to today and what gives you cause for hope for their lives today, in Ireland or elsewhere. This is usually where I say Mayo and Sam McGuire, but I think, <laughs> I, think it's, I think it could be the right audience, could be wrong. Um, you know, it, there is phenomenal, first and foremost, there's phenomenal awareness now more than ever, and, and, and not to be an agent, but like the likes of Rory, I, I mean, I, I grew up in Shrew, which is like five, couple, about ten, ten miles away from... It's a shit hole. It is. <laughs> uh, it's very cosmopolitan area. <laughs> uh, but I grew up, uh, and, you know, someone like Rory uh, is the, the, the giant I stand on. Uh, and there's two in our family. I thought we were the same age. <laughs> a little bit of a... Uh, and there was, at the time of growing up, so in like rural Ireland, you know, we have... Uh, we have a queen, um, and that's phenomenal because, like that, that that great marketing line of if you cannot see it, you cannot be it, and and when you have outspoken activists like that, um, then the weight is is, is removed so, somewhat, um, and and bit by bit. Now it shouldn't just be down to activists to do that either. And, um, I certainly welcome more movements on. Uh, rainbow family supports uh, and legislation and that hate uh, hate crime legislation that should be coming sooner rather than later um, more LGBTI work in in a European context um, further further education support so that if you're not in college or experiencing your first experience or uh, online and trying to figure out who you are and then having to do it on your own because you don't know where to go I mean that that, that time has to that time has to end um, so there is so much work out there, uh, and there's so much greatness out there. It's just distilling, making sure we're connecting, dispelling the, the nonsense that Meninia spoke about, but and, and really empowering um, our younger generation. That whether you're a soccer player, politician, or or or, or the queen of rural Ireland, that you know that your orientation is so far off the tick box of the page. That you're just celebrating them as a person, and I think that's where the utopia lies for for me and our younger generation. That's something we talk about a lot of things is queer utopia things. So for you, Rory, what will be your piece of hope, a piece of utopia for sure the young, the young queers <laughs> today? True, slipping off into the Atlantic Ocean. You know, um, um, uh, I mean, I think what law, what law, you know, gives me constant hope about it is, um, you know, that the the landscape has been queered, um, and that is. You know, almost a first, you know, sort of you know, for Ireland. Um, you know, when we were kids, um, you know, there was no queerness in the world at all. Um, there was no Graham Norton on your television. There was, you know, Larry Grace. <laughs> Larry Grace, but he wasn't out and proud. Of, you know, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Um, it was it was an absolute queer desert. And so, you know, I think every Irish queer person, you know, up to a certain age, thought they were the only one in the world. And and you know the. the the landscape of Europe has changed in that way dramatically, and that you know every teenager in Europe sees queer people, whether you know the, the whether they live in a, you know, you know yes, <laughs> or whether they live in a Polish you know gay free zone or not. You know, um, th there are queers in the world now, and they're impossible not to see, and and that is the one thing that would have made a dramatic and huge difference to me when I was young, um, taking away that you know fear and loneliness about it. Um, so to me, it's going to be very hard to roll back on that, no matter what happens. Um, you know, the queers are out there. And, um, and, and that, to me, is the sort of the, the bedrock on which everything else you know, it builds up on. Um, you know, one of the things that I get asked a lot about in other discussions is about the, the stigma around HIV. And I would say, you know, the queers showed us how, how to resolve that, and that is, you know, to give every single person living with HIV the, the, the opportunity or the ability or the, you know, the, the support to be able to stand up and say they're living with HIV. Because um, all of the awful stuff that was happening to queer people happened because people were able to live in the world and assume that they didn't know any queer people. You know, in the 1970s and Ireland, most people thought, I don't know any queer people. Um, and of course, it wasn't true. And, and Ireland has changed because enough queer people came out. 
And now you can't live in Ireland and not know a queer person. Because enough queer people came out. And, and you can't really shove people back in the closet. Things can go backwards. There can be attacks on the rights you already have. Um, as we see in America, they can be taken away. Um, but I think it's very hard to put the genie back in the bottle um, once they're out and the queer genies are out. And, and that, to me, is not only the most amount of change, it also is the thing that always gives me some hope about the future, even when things look bad. Although uh, the march is over, it doesn't mean that the Pride Festival is all over, because there are some other great events coming up this week for members of the community to enjoy. Starting tonight, there's going to be Dance to the Underground, Queer Rock and Roll. It takes place Philip McGee's down in Parnell Square, 8 p.m. to 2.30 a.m. And it's on tomorrow night as well, so that's a great event for those into rock and roll. Tomorrow night, the, believe it or not, LGBT Ireland in partnership with the Irish Refugee Council will be putting on an event. It's in the Davenport Hotel at 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. The uh, Pride Poets, they return on uh, on Tuesday night. They'll be, of course, down there in the fabulous Street 66. That uh, starts at 7 p.m. and runs until 9 p.m. And finally, Thursday morning, Mother's Day performs Heart-Shaped Turnstile. That's going to be in Drop Dead Twice up there in uh, Francis Street. And that's going to take place on the 30th, which is that, is that Thursday? It is Thursday, 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. So there you go, some great events to conclude the Dublin Pride Festival. Come out off the sidewalk and onto the street To the sound of those legendary feet